like to formally welcome Marco back Thank to you. South Florida, this time virtually, with such important training for everyone in the audience looking to get better at DAX. Uh, Marco Russo is a business intelligence consultant and mentor. He's a, an SSAS maestro, also a trainer, books author. Here I have the DAX Bible. I don't know if you can see my screen. <laughs> There it is. The, you, you need this book. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he also trains and consults on DAX and data modeling for Power BI and analysis services. Again, thank you so much for your visit. Thank and you, please, Cecilia. when you're ready. Okay, so I start sharing my screen and let me just move the data here. Okay, so. Uh, Today I'm talking. I'm going to talk about uh, DAX, and the idea is the is the uh, to recap the filter context, which is the most important concept in DAX in one hour. Usually we 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 need more time to explain all the details. So I will try to recap all the important elements, so that if you never uh, investigated too much into this concept, you will get a broad overview. If you already have some knowledge of about DAX, filter contest and row contest, I hope this will be a good recap and the right moment to ask your questions if you have some doubt. Um, I should have time at the end of the session for questions and answers, but um, if you want to stop me at any moment, if you have some question about the specific points, don't worry. I mean, I can uh, I can manage this so I can manage uh, interruption and uh, see whether I need to focus more on some concept or I will delay the, the question later if I see that it takes too, too much time to answer. Um, my voice is not 100% good. It was uh, it is better than one week ago when I had to uh, delay, but it's still not 100%, so I hope uh, you will hear well enough. So, uh, well, you already have seen in the presentation, I work in Secret BI, we have uh, online training courses, we also deliver training uh, in, in person when this will be possible again, and you can find a lot of resources on sqlbi.com. The idea of this session is to talk about the evaluation context. So we mainly focus on filter context, row context, how calculate works, manipulating the filter context and manipulating the row context for the context transition. These are the more important concepts that you have to learn if you want to really master DAX. The QR code you see here is uh, available to download the same uh, slides I have here, but uh, you will see this also at the end, and I will provide to Cecilia uh, the, the slides if, if necessary. So let's start looking at how DAX works, so how, um, how the evaluation context works. When we have, so let's uh, start from uh, this uh, Power BI report. You see here, I have a report. Of course, there is a model here. There are a few tables. Uh, there are relationships. There are measures. But when you have a report, you have here numbers, which usually are the result of a formula. In this case, we are using sales amount. Sales amount is a measure defined with this expression. But the thing is that this is a single expression, is always the same, is always the same formula, but in every cell we see a different number. So how is it possible that the same formula produces a different number in every cell of the report? And the idea is that the formula is always the same, but in every cell there is a different evaluation context. And the evaluation context is what drives the result of the calculation. For example, if I put this uh, measure in a card in Power BI or in a pivot table without any other filter in columns and rows in a pivot table in Excel, I just see one number. 
And the number I see is the result of the sum of all the rows in the sales table. The sales table has, in this case, uh, 100,000 rows, I think, in my model. But for every row, I'm asking to multiply the net price by the quantity that I have in each row. So what we are saying here in this sum x, for each row in the sales table, multiply the quantity by the net price and then sum the result of these multiplications. But now I am doing this evaluation aggregating 100,000 rows. What happens if I change the pivot table and I include the value of a column like the product color or in Power BI here, I have, uh, yes, I have the product color too. It's just different numbers, but you see that the, the name here is the column product color that has been placed in the rows of the matrix. Well, what is, what is, what is happening now is that every cell is applying an implicit filter. And this implicit filter groups only the rows in the sales table that correspond to each product color. So this cell is black, which means give me all the transactions of all the products that have a product color that is black. And the same for blue, multi, and so on. The grand total is still the same. The grand total is still the sum of all the rows without any exception. So the idea is that we write a formula once, but the formula is executed in an evaluation context. The evaluation context applies filter that change the evaluation of the formula. So what drives the evaluation context? First of all, the evaluation context we are considering now is called the filter context. And the filter context is driven in Excel by a very small number of elements. In, in Excel, this is a pivot table in Excel. In Excel, you have uh, the rows here, you have the columns, you have the pivot table filter, and you have slicers that you can um, connect to the pivot table. So there could be multiple elements in the rows in the columns. You can have a nested uh, structure. So, so for example, you could have a product category, product subcategory, product color, product brand. So you might have multiple elements, but the idea is that when you look at the report, every cell has a different set of filters. And this is what produces a different number. Because if we had two cells with the same filters, we should see the same number, right? So the only reason why we see different numbers is because every cell has different filters. Now, when we have a cell in the report, so for example, let's consider this cell in the report. You see that we have green, large, and internet. We're looking at a very, very simple case where the entire model is made by a single table. The table has uh, four columns, city, channel, color, size, but every cell has a different filter, which is a set of filters. And the set of filters for this cell is large green internet. And large green internet corresponds to only this row. And so when I sum the quantity, when I sum the column quantity, I get here 64, because this is the only value that satisfy all the conditions that we have in the filter. Different cell, different set of filters. But when we look at the grand total of the pivot table, at this point, we no longer have a filter for the sides or the color. We still have a filter for the channel. The channel has to be internet. In this case, we have four, four rows that have channel equal to internet. And a quantity value here, 240, is the result of the sum of the quantity value for all the rows that satisfy the current filter context. So once again, every cell is a different filter, has a different filter, has a different set of filters. And it doesn't matter if, in this case, this cell is actually the sum of these two or the sum of these other two. It doesn't matter because every cell is a different evaluation. 
by coincidence, we could obtain the same value by summing these two numbers, but actually the engine is not doing this, right? So we have to imagine that every cell is a different subquery. From a conceptual point of view, you have a number of queries that correspond to the number of cells that you see in the report. It is not actually true, but because there are optimizations, but conceptually you can imagine that this is um, what is happening. Now, in Excel it's easy, but in Power BI it's more complex because in Power BI we have uh, multiple elements, multiple visuals that could generate different interactions with the filter context. For example, here, if you look at this cell that I highlighted, we have a matrix here with, with quantity and rent, and we see this number for uh, Contoso. So the Contoso brand has the sum of quantity that is 3676. However, if you look at the filter applied to this cell, there are other two elements that are applying a filter for the evaluation of the quantity. And these elements are the education slicer and the selection made in the bar chart here. You see that this year 2007 has been selected. And because it is selected, in the representation of the filter context, we have uh, one value assigned as a filter to calendar year. You can see here a graphical representation of the filter context. The filter context is a set of filters where every filter is a list of one or more values for one column. In this case, for calendar year, we have a CY 2007. For education, we have two values. We have two selections in the education slicer, high school and partial college, which means that the evaluation of this cell, Contoso, brand equal Contoso, education, one of these two values in calendar year 2007, this is the filter context where the quantity is evaluated for this cell. And we know the result is 376, but again, remember every cell has some difference in the filter context, and for this reason, it produces a different result. So Power BI is more complex because uh, all the visuals that you have in the page could influence the filter context. And when you look at the Power BI UI, you also have uh, these filters at the visual level, at the page level, at the report level, that could influence every cell of this page. So you have to pay attention at all the possible sources of the filter context when you want to evaluate. So if we recap, if we want to recap this first part of the filter context, the filter context is uh, a set of filters defined by, in a pivot table, what we apply to row columns and slicers and uh, filters of the pivot table in Excel. For Power BI, any visual that is enabled to transfer the filter to the visualization where you are computing some number can influence the filter context. The filter context is this set of filters and every row that is not filtered by the filters that we are applying will be ignored. So if we are filtering only one year, every transaction in different years will be ignored unless you write some DAX code in your calculation that changes the filter context. So you can always write code in DAX that modifies the filter context. But the start, the initial filter context for every cell is defined by the interaction of the user with the user interface of the report. This is the idea. So there is another element, however, that is required to evaluate almost any calculation in DAX. And this second element is called the row context. The row context is something that, uh, at the beginning, is, it, it seems more difficult to understand because uh, it's something that is not visible in the report that you when, you, when, when you look at the report like this one, this report, we don't have any row context. 
Actually, we have some raw context, but not something that is immediately visible. The raw context is more visible when you create a calculated column, because uh, in order to evaluate a calculated column, there is a current row that evaluates the entire row of the table, including the new calculated column. So the raw context is something that enables access to the individual values of a physical table in, in, a, in a row of a physical table. What does it mean? Well, if I go in the table view here, in the data view, and I go in the sales table here, you see that I have the ability to create a new column. The new column is created here, and here we can write an expression like, for example, quantity multiplied by net price. And if I write this formula, I'm creating a column that will have for each row the result of the multiplication of quantity multiplied by net price. So if I scroll down where I see some value other than one, let's see if I have something different than one. Okay, this one. You see that when, I, when this is two, the column is a net price multiplied by two and, and so on. So we can actually see different values here. The expression that we write in a calculated column is evaluated for each row of the table. And the row context is what actually enables the execution of the DAX code that we are writing here. If I didn't have a row context, the column reference I'm writing here will not be valid. What is the syntax saying? Give me the value of the quantity column from the sales table, but in which row? Well, the current row. So this notion of current row is what we call the row context. For a calculated column, you can imagine that we have a row context for every row of the entire table, but actually the row context is used in every iterator in DAX. When you write some X, you have a row context that iterates the table that we pass as the first argument. If I go back to my report here, if you remember, the sales amount measure that we are displaying here in this report is actually a measure defined this way. Sum X, sales, and then I have an expression. This is exactly the same expression I could include in a calculated column of the sales table. But in this case, we are using this expression in the iterator over the sales table. Sum X is saying for each row in the sales table that is visible in the current filter context, execute this expression row by row. Again, the row context is what enables the execution of a column reference. You can write a column reference, give me the value quantity from the sales table, if and only if you have a row context. So the row context is something that corresponds to, to it's, it's similar to a loop, right? You, you are looping over all the rows of a table. It's like having a cursor in a SQL in a relational database the task cursor, for example. And this is what we, so it's called the row context, but the easiest way to think about this is thinking about the current row. So when we go back to our uh, picture here, where we have uh, the, the pivot table that shows a number here, this number is the result of this formula, some X orders, quantity multiplied by price. How does it work? How is it evaluated? Remember, every cell is a different evaluation. For this particular cell highlighted here, we have an initial filter context. In this case, the initial filter context has only one filter, channel, which has to be internet. Now, if we apply this filter context to this table, how many rows are visible? Only four. So when some X iterates the order table, it actually retrieves only the rows in the order table that are visible through the filter context. And for each row, it generates a row context that evaluates the second argument. Quantity multiplied by price in the first row, in the second row, 
in the third row and so on. So you can imagine that every time you see an iterator, this is what is happening under the cover. And this happens conceptually also if you don't have a, a multiplication. Imagine you have just sum of says quantity is the same thing. You iterate row by row and the evaluation is just one column. You don't see a multiplication, you don't see a complex uh, operation, but it's still the same. The result of the value computed row by row is then aggregated according to the aggregation function. In this case, we are doing sum x, and so the result is the sum of the evaluation made row by row, iterating over the order table. Every cell of the report does this. So it seems uh, very, very expensive, it is, but actually there are internal optimizations that improve the performance. But conceptually, every cell is a different evaluation. So this is important to, to understand why, for example, if I create here a measure, Let's try to do this. I go here and I create a new measure and I create this measure called test. Test is equal to says quantity. Oops, sorry. Says quantity. And you see that even though I write a valid syntax because the says quantity exists as a column in my model, if I try to write this expression, you see that IntelliSense, the editor, is not uh, using the color black. It's actually highlighting as an error the sales quantity. And if I click Enter, the error says a single value for column quantity in table sales cannot be determined. Now, this is an error message that I don't like very much because it would be better to say it's impossible to execute this syntax because there is no row context. When you create a measure, the measure doesn't have a row context. The measure is executed in the filter context, not in the row context. The row context only exists in calculate columns, and we are creating a measure, or in iterators. So in order to get a row context to execute these uh, two column references, I have to write a sum or a sum x. And this is confusing because actually it seems that the problem is that I have too many rows in the table, but even though I had only one row in the table of sales, I will see exactly the same error. So a better error would be you need a row context. I write only sales quantity. I have actually the same error. Come on. Okay, quality. Here we go. And you see the same error again, even though we know that I could write here sum of says quantity, and this solves the problem. But why this solves the problem? Because uh, we're using the aggregation sum? No, in reality, because uh, sum. It's not a real function. Sum internally does this. And when you have some x table and then an expression here, this expression is executed in a row context. So also for a simple aggregation like sum average with a single column, in reality, what is happening? You are executing an iterator and the iterator generates a row context, which is the only way that you can use to retrieve the value from a single row in a table from a certain column. When you write size quantity and you want to get the value quantity from a uh, the value from the quantity column of the table says, you need a current row. You want to do this for multiple rows, you need an iterator. So you need a row context. This is the idea, the basic idea of the row context index. And this explains why we might see these context errors which can happen because we basically don't have the necessary, in this case, row context or filter context. When I create a new report, the uh, report is blank. I put some measure there. Usually the measure gets the total for the entire table. So if I go back here and I create a new page 
and I get my sales amount. Come on. I get my sales amount. I move the sales amount here. And I use, for example, uh, a card. What is this number? This is the, the value of sales amount executed without any filter because the filter context by default is empty. You always have a filter context, always, every time, but the filter context could be empty. And if you have no filters, you get access to the entire model, to, the, to all the rows of a table. The row context only exists in certain conditions. Calculate the column, iterators. So in, in a report where you don't write anything, you just put a measure, you don't have a row context. Without a row context, any attempt to retrieve the value from a column reference generates an error. So the row context is required to iterate tables. And by iterating tables, we can access the value of uh, a table. The integration between filter context and row context is called the evaluation context. Now, these elements uh, can work together. And for example, here, we can see that in this cell, we have two filters in the filter context, channel internet and color green. In this filter context, the measure that you see on the right of the screen is actually retrieving two rows from the orders table, and some X invoke the filter function. The filter function iterates orders. Filter is another iterator. Filter retrieves all the rows visible in the filter context from the orders table, and for each row, it evaluates order price greater than one. Now, of these two rows, only one satisfies the filter and the other is ignored. So in this case, if I execute this code for this particular cell, the initial filter context has two rows. Filter consume one of these two rows, the other is returned by the filter, and SumX iterates only one row at this point. This is not efficient code, it's just an example of how DAX works. And the result of the SumX iterating only one row from orders resulting from the filter, multiplying quantity by order price, we return 192. Again, the same evaluation for every cell of the model. We have special functions in DAX that can ignore the filters. What does it mean? Well, we have seen in this case an example where I can retrieve a table and I can add another filter using a table function, filter. Filter is a function that consumes a table and returns a table, usually with a smaller number of rows. But in that, we have functions that can ignore the filter. Or is a function that removes the filter from the filter context. What does it mean? Look at the value of this measure, total all amount, is always 749, 749 in every cell why this happens. Because in this cell, the initial filter context is still internet and green, same as, the, same as uh, the previous example. But what happens is that in this initial filter context, some X uses uh, all and all ignores the filter context. So the result of all orders is the table orders complete with all the rows, ignoring any filter. And so it doesn't matter what the initial for filter context was. When I execute this code, I always iterate the entire table orders. And for this reason, we always see 749 in every cell of the report. The two example, examples that I've shown you now use a table function, not calculate, which is the real uh, function that we use to manipulate the filter context, but just, just to introduce the concept. In these examples, I have um, shown you a model with a single table, but actually what we usually have are multiple tables with relationships. What happens when we have multiple tables, relationships, and what happens to the filter context? Well, the filter context actually propagates automatically through relationships, following the filter propagation direction. 
For example, here we have a, a sales table connected to product and customer, and then product is connected to subcategory and uh, subcategory to product category. So if I apply a filter to one category, the filter propagates to the subcategory, to the product, and to the sales. And then it stops. By default, the filter does not propagate uh, over that limit. Unless we have a bidirectional call filter. But before talking about that, let me go back here. We can see here, this is the old visualization. Now Power BI has a more advanced, not advanced, but a, a newer graphic for the visualization of the um, relationships, even though the latest version uh, is not something I like very much, and I hope that they will uh, fix it soon. So I'm using the uh, old one. But you see that regardless of the system that you use, you always have this arrow that shows in which direction the filter propagates. In this case, this propagation says if I filter one city here or one country, the filter applied here will propagate to the sales table. Now, normally we want to use filters that are, that propagates the filter in a single direction, usually one to many, but it's possible to create bi-directional filters. With a bi-directional filter, the filter can propagate in both sides. So in other words, if I go here and I enable here the bi-directional filter between customer and sales, the side effect of this new filter is that if now I filter, for example, one year, the year filter sales, but this year filter sales and also filter customers. So I can change the propagation of the filters and the filter context basically always gets all the filter propagated through the filter direction assigning each relationship. This is automatic. You can change it with DAX code, but by default, you get this automatically. The best practice is not to enable, is to not enable the bidirectional filter in the model, is to enable the bidirectional filter only in DAX code, but conceptually, if you have a bidirectional filter applied to the model, any calculation always propagate the filter in the both direction over that relationship. The bidirectional filter could be expensive. So there are two problems with the bidirectional filter. One is that they could uh, create complexity in interpreting the results of the calculation. And the second problem is performance. And most of the times you don't have you don't realize that you have a performance impact also for reports where you were supposed to not use the bidirectional filter. So the bidirection, once you activate the bidirectional, the bidirectional filter, it's always there and you always pay the price. Even though you used or enabled the bidirectional filter only for a small calculation, but it doesn't matter. Once you enable it in the model, it's, it's always there. Um, so, recap. The evaluation context is made by filter context and row context. When we have a model with multiple relationships, the filter context automatically propagates through the relationships, whereas the row context does not propagate through the relationships. You can manipulate the row context between tables, but actually it requires some DAX code. The relationship by itself does not propagate a row context across different tables. So the example that I shown you before for the filter context, in reality, we're showing how to consume data, but not how to alter the filter context. And we said, okay, the filter context is, is uh, automatically applied by the user interface of the um, Power BI, Excel, whatever. But in DAX, we can manipulate the filter context. We can write filters in the filter context, or we can remove filter from the filter context. We already have seen a function called all that ignores the filter context, but we have a function that is called calculate, which can manipulate the filter context. 
Calculate works this way. You write the expression you want to evaluate, followed by one or more filters that you want to apply to the filter context. Calculate gets the initial filter context, applies the filter that you specify, and then execute the expression. Which means that Calculate has a complexity. It has to be read bottom up. Because it, when you read Calculate, first you apply the filters, then you evaluate the expression. So the first argument you see in Calculate is actually the last one that you have to evaluate which is similar to a select statement in SQL. When you read a select statement, select column, column, column from table where condition. How do you read the select statement? Usually you go to the bottom where you see the where condition, you see all the filters applied to the table or to the tables, and then you uh, have an idea about what the result will be from the, from the SQL query. And here is similar. Calculate allows you to write something like that. For example, I can write calculate, measure, or expression, but usually calculate evaluates a measure reference, applying a filter to net price. Say it's net price greater than 100. The filter in calculate can be defined in several ways, and the easiest way is through a predicate, a logical expression, column, greater than 100. It's like a, a condition that you would put in a where of a select statement. Well, when I do this, so let's uh, go back here and let's write here. So if I create here a measure, and I call this measure uh, equal to, Calculate, and I want to calculate the sales amount. Sales amount is not this, where the brand is equal to Contoso. Okay. So if I run this code, what happens? When I put the measure Contoso here, and let's, uh, let's format this the right way. You see that the number that we see for each color is usually smaller than the number here. Think about what is happening. For example, in this cell, the initial filter context is just a product color equal red. But then my calculate statement receives this initial filter context, writes a second filter, brand equal contoso, and now in this new filter context that has two filters, red, Contoso, it evaluates the original sales amount measure. So the measure we are evaluating here, sales amount, is the same measure that we evaluated in this first column, but because we are applying a second filter, the number is smaller because we have more filters. Now, even though we write the filter using this syntax, what is really happening behind the scenes is that a table is generated to represent the filter. A filter is always a table, which means that the real code executed here is the code that has this syntax. You don't have to write a code this way. I'm just trying to explain what is happening. When I write just product brand equal contoso, what is happening? I'm generating a table expression that generates a table that has one column and in this case, only one row, which is the value Contoso for the product brand. This is the filter written in the filter context. A filter is a table. We had an initial table, just one color. Now we have two tables, one table with one row, the color red, one table with another row, brand Contoso. And these are the filters that we apply to the filter context. So filters are tables. In Calculate also allow you to write not only a predicate or a table expression in an explicit way, it also allows you to apply what we call filter modifier. All with a single column apparently is a list of all the colors, but actually what is happening is that all is removing the filter from the product color. 
indeed, if I go back to this visualization and let me create another measure here. And let's call all colors say it's equal to calculate of six month if all color. So if I use this definition now, and I remove this, you see that now the number is always the same. And this number is always the same and correspond to the total we have seen here. What am I doing here? I'm saying I want to get the current filter context. I want to remove the filter from product color, and then I want to evaluate sales amount. Now, all, when used in calculate, has a different meaning. It doesn't mean give me all the colors. It means removes the filter from the color. And in order to simplify this uh, concept, Microsoft introduced us an alias, an, another name for the same function, which is remove filters. Is X is absolutely the same thing. The only difference is that I cannot use remove filters as a table function like I did before with uh, some X all, whereas all can have two meanings. It could be used as a table function or it could be used as a filter removal. In order to disambiguate this, I suggest you in modern code to write remove filters instead of all, but if you write all, it's absolutely the same and there are no differences, so the performance is the same. It's just a question of how you want to write the code. Most of the times, I want to write the filter as a predicate, but again, the the predicate is, is an easy way to write a code, but you have to understand that internally we are generating um, um, a table here. Now, what happens when I filter a particular uh, color? For example, if I write here red sales, and I write here product color equal red. If you remember, when I created my other calculation, uh, the second measure I wrote here was just uh, uh, Contoso, brand, brand Contoso, right? This number here is Contoso brand. Now, if you look at the, if you look at the moment here, you see Contoso sales is this number, red sales now is always the same value. Why in this, why in this case, we were combining the brand filter with the color filter of the row, and now we are doing a completely different thing. What, what is this number? This number is this number duplicated across all the rows. So what is it? What is um, what is the behavior of this measure? If you think about this cell, this cell is uh, a cell that has an initial filter context with color equal Azure. But because my measure red sales is saying I want to write the red value in the product color in the filter context. Well, this new filter overrides the previous one over the same column. So if we don't have a filter over a column, the filter is combined with existing filters, but when we already have a filter in the filter context for a column, then applying a new filter over the same column replaces the previous one. For this reason, we are replacing the product color and we were not replacing the product brand because there was no filter over product brand before. But what if we don't want to override the existing filter? Well, we have a special function called keep filters, which says apply this filter without removing any existing filter over the same column. If I use this technique, you see that now only in this row I see the value red, but in these other cells I see blank. Why? Because the initial filter contest here has color gold, then I have another filter color red. The two filters are kept in the filter context, but they are incompatible. We don't have any product that is gold and red at the same time. You can see how this could be useful if instead of writing, uh, instead of writing just one color, you write, for example, in, and we write red, comma, Blue. Now, 
Look at what happens. I'm saying in the new measure I created red sales, I'm actually writing a filter over two colors. I say the color could be blue or red, but I don't remove the initial filter existing over the product color, which means that now you see that here we have black because these colors are incompatible. But when I have red, I see red. When I see when I have blue, I see blue. When I had the grand total, the grand total is just the sum of red and blue because these are the two filters I applied to the filter context here. And so key filters is a keyword you can use in calculate that changes the way the filter is applied to the filter context by calculate. It doesn't remove the existing filter, it just keeps the existing filter. So every filter you apply in calculate is a table in the filter context. It's technically is a filter in the filter context. And every filter can have multiple columns. For example, you could have a filter that combine year and month. Because if you filter December 2006 and January 2007, and you don't want to get the filter for December 2007 or January 2006, you need a specific combination of two columns, year and month. These are arbitrary shaped filters that you can create with more complex syntax, like a filter over all two columns. The definition of the filter context is a filter is a table. This table is uh, basically a list of rows that we call tuple. A tuple is a value for a set of columns. A filter is a table of tuples, and the filter context is a set of filters. And is the filter context. In each calculate statement, you can specify multiple filter conditions. Each filter condition generates a table. Each table is a filter in the filter context. It is combined with the existing filters according to the rules that we specified before. Override the existing filter or combine with the existing filter if you use key filters. The filters that are part of the same calculate are combined in an N condition. We call this technique an intersection between the two filters. Whereas when you have two nested calculate statements, what happens is that the outer calculate generates an initial filter, but the innermost calculate can override the previous filter. So in this case, if we apply yellow black in a measure that was executed within a calculate that was applying black and blue, actually the latest wins. The latest filter wins and overwrite the previous one. When we don't want to overwrite the previous filter, you use keep filters like we have seen before. And when you use keep filter, what happens is that the two filters are kept in the filter context together. So in this particular case, uh, by using key filters, only black will be the color visible to the users. Now, so far we talked a lot about the filter context and not much about the row context beside the initial description, but there is an important operation that can uh, create an interaction between the row context and the filter context. And this operation is the context transition. The context transition is defined by this rule. Whenever you use calculate in a row context, the row context becomes a filter context. The row context means the current row. Current row is a current row in a table. Well, imagine you create a filter where you say for each column of that table, you specify the corresponding filter. So you basically use the entire content of the table row as a filter in the filter context. Why is this useful? Well, because uh, by using calculate, you can do something like this. I show you here. If I go in the, let's go here, in the product table, okay. If I go in the product table and I create a new calculated column here, so I'm creating a column that is executed row by row in the table product. And I write here sum of quantity. 
base quantity is a column in another table, and you see that the number I show here is always the same, no matter what. However, if I write calculate, and then I write sum says quantity, you see that what happens is that the number is different now, and for each row, I have a different number. Why? What is happening here? Well, I have a row context, and calculate transforms the current row, the current product in this case, into an equivalent filter context, which means that now is like we are filtering the current product in the filter context. And what happens if I filter this product here, MGS, uh, Dell of Honor, Airborne, blah, 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 is happening that I have a filter with this product name, with this product key, with this product code, in the filter context. Now, a filter in product automatically propagates to sales, and basically what happens is that we only sum the sales quantity for the transaction related to the current product. So the context transition is a way to start from a row context, but actually obtain a result in the filter context as a consequence of that. And this is extremely, extremely powerful because uh, it is the way we can actually uh, create like subqueries iterating a table because uh, we start the context transition with the context transition to retrieve data from other places. Now, what, what is important now is that when we have, uh, um, let me go back to this calculated column. You see that now I wrote this sum says quantity this way. Now, if you remember, we have a measure that is defined like this. Sales amount is a measure that is actually defined using the same sum x you see here. And you see that I'm using a calculate statement without any filter. Now, you could add the filters to the filter context in calculate, but you can use calculate with just one argument. What happens if I execute this code? I see in the column the value that correspond to the sales amount for the current product. Now, if you remember this expression, let me comment this expression. This expression is absolutely identical to sales amount. And indeed, if I replace this expression with sales amount, I see the same value here. What is less obvious at this point is that if I remove calculate and I just keep the measure reference, sales amount, when I click OK, you see that the number is still the same. Wait a minute. But if I comment sales amount and I uncomment this sum x, now the numbers is different. The, the numbers are different. This is always the same value. If you remember, it's like when I created the sum at the beginning. If I have sum without a calculate, there is no context transition, I get the entire table. And now I'm getting the entire table and I'm summing the sales, the sales uh, table entirely. Why this difference? Well, the reason for that is that a measure reference is not just the replacement of this. When you have a measure reference, you can replace the measure reference writing calculate, followed by the definition of the measure, and then this. So a measure reference always implies calculate and always implies the context transition. And for this reason, here you see that the, the context transition is uh, implicitly executed every time you have uh, every time you have a measure reference. The measure reference can be replaced by the original uh, definition of the measure by writing calculate before. And this is very important because also justify why we have a performance issue when we write measures in large iterators because calculate is expensive. It's like a correlated subquery and it has a cost for that. So we have seen that we have two elements to know very well, row context and filter context. The row context is always required when you want to evaluate a column reference. A column reference is valid only within a row context. 
if you say no, but I can write just some, some internally generates a row context. So you always need a row context to retrieve the data from a column in a table. Calculate can change the filter context and Calculate can perform the context transition, combining iterators with the propagation of filters that generate different calculations. So row context, filter context, and context transition are the three more important concepts that you have to learn in DAX to be able to create any kind of calculation. So questions. Let's see if we have questions. There was one question from Chui. Yep. Uh, in which scenario a nested calculate will make sense? Sorry, which scenario? A nested calculate would make sense. A nested calculate. It's very unlikely that you write a single expression with nested calculate. What is easier to do is something like this. Let's say that I have sales amount, right? Then I have red sales that let's restore. Let me do something different. So let's say that we have red sales is equal to this one equal red and okay then I create another measure which is trendy says is equal to calculate of red says and I want to do, for example, a brand equal to contours. Okay, now I wrote one calculate that is calling red sales, but red sales is another calculate that calls sales amount, and sales amount is another definition here, this one. Now, let me show you one thing. If I go in Duck Studio, and I go one second here. The measure here, uh, trendy says, is defined this way. So I can show here how this measure is defined. And one uh, feature you have in Duck Studio is the ability to show the chain of the measure. So I start from trendy sales, but in order to solve trendy sales, I need red sales, and red sales has sales amount, and so I see all the definitions here. But if you think about what I'm doing, I can try to generate the expression, the DAX expression corresponding to trendy sales, removing all the measure references. If I do define and expand measures, you see here that Let's see. Uh, okay. You see that what we really what we are really doing is this: calculate that calls another calculate, calls another calculate, calls another calculate. Now it's unlikely that I write a code this way. Usually I obtain this code by encapsulating different calculation. But if you want to understand what is happening, this is what is happening. So understanding the behavior of nested calculate statements is the way you can understand what happens when you have a reference that calls another major reference that calls another major reference and so on. You can always expand the code this way is identical. The code you see here is identical to the code you have seen before. There is absolutely no difference between the execution, query plan, performance uh, of using one technique or another is absolutely the same. More questions? Yep. I have a question. Yes, Julie. So 
going with the assumption that to learn DAX and Power BI well, you'd be best to first learn the core concepts. So I heard you say at the beginning of this talk that this is one of the key core concepts, the filter context. What other core concepts would you say that one should learn first before getting into other details? For, for the DAX language, nothing else. Okay. I mean, well, even though it seems so simple, but actually once you realize that you have raw context, filter context, and context transition, you are at 90% of the requirement for understanding DAX. The problem is to get used to these concepts because mm -hmm. uh, the real issue is that if you ask me the similarity between DAX and another language, I don't have a good one. I have a similarity for the raw context, the cursor, or the loop in a programming language. Uh, I have a similarity so for the filter context, which is the where condition in a select statement. I have no idea about something similar to the context transition. Uh, hmm. but the context transition is crucial to understand what is happening when you do a complex calculation. And this is where I really have a problem because I cannot provide you an analogy with something else. That was the word you used earlier that I was that I couldn't understand. You said the cursor. Yep. What what is that used within? Um, I use the cursor because it's a concept that is familiar to people who have a SQL background, Oracle or Access or SQL Server. If you have a background in programming languages, think about a loop, a for each loop in a programming language. Uh, in Excel, think about the sum if. If you have Excel, is the closest concept to to the iteration that you have for the raw context. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Don't use okay. cursors. Yes, I know. I, I'm not suggesting to use the cursor. I'm just saying the the analogy, the the, the similar concept is that one. I understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but yeah, it's a it's a good comparison. Yeah. By the way, Marco, I love the tool. I use that studio all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Especially because of the execution plan, why don't you show us how to use that? Um, I uh, I have used it just to um, to see what is happening in terms of the um, in terms of the performance, but I haven't dwelled too much on it. So, what happens if you find you know like for example, a lot of people want to know about performance, and they usually blame that. So uh, sometimes it's not that, right? It could be something else. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we have a few minutes that, that you can show us that. In that uh, it's, it's a very, very long discussion about because uh, <laughs> DAX Studio shows information provided by the engine to analyze the query plan and other stuff. But the reality is that it's very complex to try to understand what is happening without a, a good introduction about how the engine works conceptually. Uh, what is the formula engine, the storage engine, and mm -hmm. how they interact, how the compression works. Without a basic understanding of this concept, those numbers don't make much sense. And so, it, I mean, it's another hour. This is my problem is that I, I know that I don't, I cannot even yeah. start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And a performance session. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming up. There are there are uh, videos also for that. 
But actually, uh, when Marco visited us in 2018, he presented why my report is so slow. That was an amazing presentation, and I yeah, think yeah, it's yeah, uh, yeah. recorded on YouTube. Yes, so we yes, yes. Look for the video. Oh. There is a, a question from Wilson in the chat. It's a long question. Uh, you mentioned that a filter is a table and a row context becomes content as a filter. So is DAX interacting with a virtual queue in memory like an XLS using conditional formatting like KPI flags assigning color to a column based on its value? Is that similar? No. Um. No, I would say no. It's um, don't don't try to create a more complex concept to represent something that is not that complex. Sorry for the word, but there are too many concepts in this sentence. <laughs> it's, simple. it's simple. You have uh, filters. You have uh, iterators. You have a row context, and that's it. That's it. If if you understand, if you really understand uh, the, the 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 real nature of 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 DAX, which is basically you have this data in your tables, and you continue to scan and compute always, 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 always the same thing, and that's it. It's 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 much easier than, than but the problem is that. To metabolize the concept and to think like the engine thinks is not easy because remember you try to map something into something that you know and trust me I don't have an equivalent concept for the context transition. I mean I could provide a concept but it's too complex and so it's not really simplifying your life because if I tell you that the context transition is like a correlated subquery in SQL Many people say, so what? Uh, no. <laughs> so, you know, Marco, I use that same example, you know, in a funny way. If you think like the engine, like you tell a friend, OK, go run around a, a marathon when they are not a runner, they're going to be like, OK, fine, I do it, but I'm going to be slow. Versus when you write something that that's like, that's going to be like, yes, I'm going to do it. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, think like the engine, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's the idea. I, I know that sometimes it's not easy, but for, for the for a simple calculations, actually, it is easy. It's 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 not that difficult. Um, the problem is that when you have a complex model and you want to create a complex calculation, usually you try to cut the corner and to get the result without thinking about all the steps that are required in the calculation. And this is where people usually get confused. Mm -hmm. OK, there is a question from Waldemar. Uh, could you talk about putting the generate dimensions out of the fact table in its own dimension and how that affects the filter context? So, OK, first of all, the generate dimension means that you have a, a column in the fact table that you want to store in a separate dimension or you keep in the fact table through a relationship. Um, so the, there are two problems here. One is that, first of all, do you need that information? Because if you don't need some information, just don't load this information, Peter. Assuming that you need this information, the question is why? Uh, do you want to get the detail for a transaction like I'm filtering all the transactions made by a customer and I want to see the transaction ID for all the transactions made by a customer. We call this operation uh, drill through and there are very, very quick techniques to obtain this information in DAX. Unfortunately, Power BI doesn't use these techniques well, doesn't use these techniques at all. Excel is much better from this point of view, but we should use uh, a property that is not exposed in Power BI that would improve the performance for that. Because if, if this was, I mean, the right way to use the, you know, the generate dimension 
as a way to do the drill through uh, would require to write this content in a column that could be also hidden to the user, but is visible when you do the drill through only. If you want to use this information the opposite way, to, to search for a transaction ID. In this case, you are exposing like the order number in the sales table. At that point, you could include the column in the sales table rather than creating a separate dimension with the order number. Because from a performance standpoint, if you create a relationship, it's just more expensive. You are duplicating a lot of data in different tables, and then you have the relationship and you pay a price for that for nothing. And in particular, if you use that for the drill through, it's a total nightmare for a performance. So if it is just for the query or for the group buying, you could, but you are spending more for no reasons. So for this reason, it's very important to understand why you want to use the generate dimensions, because without the, knowing why you need that column, I am not able to suggest you what is the right thing to do. It depends. There is more clarification about it. Uh, it's saying uh, I am thinking of orders and invoices, and I was told that I should not relate the fact tables. I want to put a filter on orders and transfer it to invoices. So let's say that I want to see I want to see the invoices that are filtered by some filter of dates that belongs to the orders. And then basically I would have to do uh, calculate, cross filter, etc. It's a bad but, idea. OK, so let me very clear. If your model is small, you could also find a way to make it working. But conceptually, you don't have to design a model this way. You have to okay. create a fact table with the orders, a fact table with the invoices. And because you are featuring the same customer, you will see the list of the elements. Getting the detail, you know, navigating, starting from, you know, the order, and then you want to see the invoices, uh, you are not using, you're not creating a report. You're creating a, a regular ERP application. So why you don't have this in your system? It should be a core feature of your ERP system. Why you are building this feature in Power BI that doesn't have the right tools to do this job? Because you will always face performance issue trying to do what you are saying. Always, every single time. If your model is small, you probably will not realize. But if you have a few million rows, it will not work well. Because so it's not designed for this. So the reason that I was doing it um, is because so the customer, they have an existing Power BI report and they have a lot of filters that applies to the orders and some of those attributes, they don't really exist in the invoice. So they want to put the filter in the orders and filter the invoices that are filtered by those filters in the orders. I know it's a little bit convoluted, but so I was thinking, like I was trying to find what I is cannot the change my mind. <laughs> Sorry, but I cannot change my mind. It is wrong. Okay. I understand. I understand. You say the customer has this situation and now they want to do that. I completely understand the situation, but this doesn't change the fact that the design is wrong. Okay, you have a bad design for whatever reason, but you have a bad design. So what, whatever solution you will find, it will be always a trade-off. It will not work all the times. So be prepared to performance issues. I right. cannot save you, right? The right thing to do is a different design of the yeah. model. It's not yeah. trying to find a solution. It doesn't work. I was trying. I was reading your book uh, on SQL on on Power BI data modeling, and uh, you know, like I, I read all the chapters, and I just couldn't find the pattern that I could apply here. So yeah, it probably is that uh, that I'm because trying to. Is, yeah. Because you cannot. I mean, again, the the it's a concept. I mean, conceptually, you want to do something for which Power BI is not designed for. 
I cannot explain this a different way. What you want to do works if you write a report. OK, let's do this. Use uh, paginated reports. You want to do what you want, use paginated reports, because in paginated reports you can do query number one, result, use the result as a parameter for query number two. You cannot do this in Power BI. You can do this in a paginated report. Use paginated reports, but you Power BI is not designed for this. Right, right. Yeah, worst case, I would have to bring those dimensions that they want to filter by to the second fact table so that they conform, and then I could filter by it. But some of them don't apply. But thank you very much, Marco. Sorry. <laughs> And I see an extra question from Dania. Um, sometimes using variables gives a different result. Is it because of change in the context? Sorry, say it again. Sometimes using variables gives a different result. Is it because of change in the context? Oh, the variables. Yeah, I, I answered that one, but let's see. Uh, Marco's opinion. Oh, I'm sorry. I was reading from yeah. the beginning. I uh, can change balance with the DA. Okay. No, I, I don't understand the. Uh, I, I'm looking for the question because I, I don't understand exactly. Now, is it where it gives a different result is because of changing context. Uh, no, I mean, no. Uh, the variable is just a, a way to store the result. Okay. A variable is a constant. A variable is not a variable. A variable is a constant. And the common mistake is to think that you can use the variable as you can use a measure. A variable is not a measure. A variable is a constant. It's not something that can be dynamically yeah, evaluated over time. It's static. This is the common error using variables So the, the first time. Yeah, it's almost like bringing that programming mindset, right, to Power BI. And um, using the variable, you know, value, value, no, my, my uh, they just the, uh, they, they, they yeah. just made a mistake in instead of using constant, they used variable and they made a mistake. It happens. <laughs> OK, so we have a last question. If you yep. have a uh, Mark is asking when you use the sum function is actually runs um, the sum X. Why not use sum X all of the time? Just to, to 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 write. I mean, it's easier to read sum for one column. If I have only one column, I can write sum, even though I know that is like sum x. But it's easier to read. You but if you want to use sum x, it's fine. It's, it's the same thing. No differences. Okay. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Thank you nothing very else. Much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, always a pleasure to have you here. And guys, uh, if you want to stay for the raffle, stay. I want to release uh, Marco so he can go <laughs> and have Thank some rest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh my God, it must be later over there. Thank you, Marco. Yeah. Have a nice Thank evening. You. Uh, hello, Thank everybody. You very much, bye bye. I appreciate your time. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thanks, Marco. Thank you. Picture, picture. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.